here's a pond. In the pond, there are fish. Now, Blake loves to fish. When Blake visits this pond for the first time, he hooks a fish, and actually, by the end of the day, Blake got two fish. He's very happy and leaves. The reproductive rate of the pond is such that two fish will repopulate. Blake comes back. But this time he brings his girlfriend, Jamie. Blake and Jamie catch two fish each. They're very happy with the day and leave. Sometime later, not having much else to do, they both come back. But word has spread about the awesome fishing at the local pond and they're joined by Mr. Boomer. At the end of the day, Blake and Jamie both caught two fish and Mr. Boomer caught three. They're happy with what they caught, and they all leave. In the coming days, Blake and Jamie break up. Well, Blake decides to go fishing because he thinks his favorite hobby will cheer him up, but he finds that there are no fish left in the pond. Blake is devastated. That was a tragic love story, but it's also a tragedy of the commons, which is a principle that suggests individuals will use shared resources in their own self-interest rather than keeping with the common good, thereby eventually depleting the resources. What happened at the pond is what happens in the real world too. Atlantic cod is a fish that lives around the coastlines in the Atlantic Ocean. In the mid-1960s, the fishing industry for cod absolutely boomed, and about 800,000 tons of cod were caught. Since then, the number of cod that were caught fell drastically, almost zeroing out in 1992. What had happened was the number of cod in the ocean plummeted so much that almost no fish could actually be caught. Since then, a number of regulations were imposed, including permits for commercial fishing of cod, the closing of access to cod habitats, and the imposing of annual catch limits. Even with all these efforts, all these years later, a 2019 report from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration still shows that cod is overfished and their populations are significantly below target levels. So what do we do? According to the World Health Organization, about 20% of the world's population derives a big portion of their annual animal protein from fish. And some small island nations depend almost exclusively on fishing as an industry to make money and for food. So we can't just stop fishing altogether. The goal is to achieve a sustainable yield or the amount of a renewable resource that can be taken without reducing the available supply. Let's go back and review how populations grow. Most populations follow a logistic growth model. Population growth starts out a little slow, then it'll grow quickly at its biotic potential, and then the growth rate will again slow down as a population reaches its carrying capacity. Let's keep this graph in mind and create a new graph of population growth and population size. So here we see the population growth rate is somewhat small when the population is small, and then the population increases as size as we reach the fastest growth rate, and then the growth rate slows down again when the population is at capacity. Let's say you're fishing from a population of fish, and you're removing fish at the same rate as the population is growing. Well, if that's the case, the population will remain the same because however many new fish are added, you are catching. But what if you catch the fish at a lower rate than the population is growing? Well, whatever fish you didn't catch will add to the population and the total population will increase. Now, what if you catch fish at a rate faster than the population is growing? Well, now the population will decrease. So to sum it up, if you're catching fish at the rate at which the population is growing, it stays the same. Catch fish at a rate lower than the population growth rate and the population will increase. Catch fish at a rate faster than the population growth rate and the population will decrease. The sustainable yield is the area I shaded in green. 
As long as you catch fish at any rate along the shaded area, the population will continue to increase. Now, you generally don't want to catch from a small population with a small growth rate because you'll probably not catch enough fish to make a profit or feed a nation, and you'll run the risk of crashing the population. Now, once a population of fish is studied and these values are determined, governments can set regulations on the number of fish that can be caught by fishermen in an area and still allow these fish populations to thrive. So let's take a look at the way we catch fish, at least at a commercial scale. One method is drift netting, which uses a long net that captures fish as they get entangled in the net. This method is very common when you're trying to catch fish that tend to move in schools like herring or sardines. Another method is long line fishing, which sets up a long chain of hooks with lures on them. This method is common when catching larger fish that don't really travel in groups like tuna or swordfish. The final method is bottom trawling, which involves dragging a net or a cage across the ocean floor. This is common when catching fish that tend to live near the floor in coastal areas like cod. All these methods of industrial scale fishing have one major disadvantage and that's bycatch or the accidental capture of animals you weren't intentionally targeting. Drift netting results in the drowning of marine animals that breathe air, like dolphins and turtles. Because many of the species susceptible to bycatch from drift netting are endangered, the practice is very limited in some areas, and the United Nations banned drift nets that are longer than one and a half miles long. Longline fishing can inadvertently catch turtles and sharks, and it results in the death of 300,000 seabirds per year. Many species of shark and turtle, by the way, are also endangered. Bottom trawling is absolutely devastating to the seafloor, especially in sensitive coastal ecosystems like seagrass beds and coral reefs. It's been described as the ocean equivalent of deforestation. Bycatch is not the only issue. We already looked at this example of overfishing with cod, where we took too many fish out of the ocean and their populations plummeted. Well, the effect of that is actually relatively large if you think about this in ocean food webs. Fish rely on other fish's food. And one of the big issues with overfishing, it's not just that, well, we're not gaining a sustainable amount of food. It's that the entire ocean ecosystem is affected because we are altering the number of species that are present in a food web. So what can we do to limit the impacts of fishing? Well, governments can impose catch limits to ensure that fishing companies stay within that sustainable yield. Governments can also set up protected areas where all fishing is banned to provide habitat to many marine organisms, especially those that are endangered due to fishing practices. Consumers like you and I can purchase fish that have a third-party sustainability seafood seal of approval. That way you know the fish that you are buying is caught or raised sustainably. And then there's a final solution, which is highly debated. And that's aquaculture, or the farming of fish, crustaceans, mollusks, aquatic plants, algae, and really any organism that lives in an ocean that can feasibly be farmed. It involves the cultivating of freshwater and saltwater populations under controlled conditions. The benefit to aquaculture like this is efficiency. It actually requires a very small area of water and it doesn't require the fueling of boats to go out for fishing expeditions. As a result, aquaculture has expanded greatly over the last few decades and now produces more fish than traditional fishing practices. Aquaculture, however, is not without its drawbacks. Having so many fish in close proximity to each other runs the risk of disease spreading very quickly through a farm. These fish still need to be fed. So aquaculture generally still relies on wild catch fishing to feed the farmed fish. So even aquaculture still relies on traditional fishing practices. Now, if you are farming fish that aren't native to the area of the farm, 
some fish might escape and potentially become invasive, meaning that they negatively impact the wild populations by outcompeting them for resources, mostly because, well, it's a non-native organism and generally doesn't have any natural predators in this new area. The waste produced by the fish can also change the water quality, even resulting in the dead zones that we discussed in the previous video. However, a more modern method of fish and crop production can utilize the fish waste. Instead of growing the fish out in the ocean or in a lake, fish can be grown in large indoor tanks. The waste they produce can then be used to fertilize plants in an aquaponic system. This system solves many of the issues related to aquaculture with the added benefit of growing plants, but because they are usually indoor facilities, they require a lot of electricity to run the pumps, the lights, perhaps some sort of heating control, and the cost benefit for this is still debated. In these last two videos on water resources and fishing, we discussed how we use water resources. In the next few videos, we'll look at how we use land resources. The key to all of these topics is sustainability. Sustainability refers to, well, humans living on Earth and our use of resources without depleting the resources so they're available for future generations. Determining the sustainable yield of resources is important if we are to preserve the functioning of this planet for our future generations. And not just of fish, but our use of any resources like trees for lumber, land for farming, and the water we use. Once again, we are all in this together. Except for Blake and Jamie, they are no longer together.